Good morning. Thank you so much to those of you who took the time to pack up your cars and drive by FBC this week. It was so good for us to be able to wave at you and chat for a little bit. We are planning another reverse parade for our FBC kids in the next couple of weeks so that they can drive by one afternoon and wave hello to their teachers that we know they're missing so much. You can watch your email and social media for that date. We're still in Acts chapter one today and we're talking about how God knows where we are, where we've been, and where he's planning to bring us. Not only does he know how everything that we've been through has affected us, but he also knows how he can use it to accomplish something in us. And so as we open God's word and worship together today, I just want to pray for our time together. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the way that you're always changing us into your image, that you welcome us back with open arms and you allow us to just be with you freely, with no reservations, completely welcomed as we are. Thank you for the way that you love us unconditionally, no matter how much we struggle and how much we turn away from you. And we're just praying that through our time together today, we go closer to you and deeper in our understanding of how much you love us. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deep? Do you know that all the darkness died the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all? Yeah. 
Hey everybody, welcome to worship, First Baptist Church, we love you. I don't know how long this is all going to go on, but in the meantime, we are looking in Acts chapter 1 and trying to just have this idea of what does it look like when you're moving through uncharted territory? You don't know the map, you don't know the way. The important thing when you're in a time like that, when you don't have the map, is you keep, you keep a close watch on your compass points to be God-centered to genuinely treasure one another, to take risks to be real with one another, to give and receive grace to one another. And if you can know the compass, maybe you can find the way. We're going to be 
sort of sort of jumping off from Acts chapter 1, that place where they went into the upper room and they joined together in prayer. But I want to go ahead and give you a text so you can find it now, so you won't have to fumble for it later. In Acts chapter 17, God says this, or Paul says this about God. He says that God marked out the appointed times of history and the boundaries and lands, and He did this so that people like us would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He's not far from any of us. An important piece of my personal theology says this, I believe that God knows where I'm at, and He cares where I'm at, and that God is at work in my circumstances even when I can't figure out what those circumstances are. It's really important, I think, really important to hold on to that in times of wondering. So in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus had ascended back to the Father, it says they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the upper room where they were staying. And those present, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, we went over this a little bit last week, all by name, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. That was an important time. In fact, in fact it was a, a time when they all joined together in prayer because they desperately needed to know that God knew where they were, that God had not forgotten them, that they had not fallen through the cracks. God knows where you've been. He knows where you are. He knows where you're going. If you can believe that, you can get through almost anything. But if you lose your grip on that, you begin questioning everything. What's God up to? Does God know? Can God be trusted? And if you're not careful, you even sort of let it all slip through your fingers until you're asking questions like, is God even real? And if He is, how will I know that? There's this, there's this thing in your heart, you know, and especially now as we're in this, this weird time of, of social distancing and, you know, stay at home. And now can you get out? Can you not get out? Can you go to the store? Can you go to church? What can you do? What can't you do? There's this thing in us that says we should be doing something. We should be moving. We should be accomplishing. We should be succeeding. And if we're not doing those things, then something must be wrong. In this place in Acts chapter 1 where they're joined together constantly in prayer, this is a picture of people who desperately needed to know that God had not forgotten them. They needed to make sense of the moment they were in. Well, in the middle of that, right, did this, this moment, this setting, this place where they could, where they could sort of lock the doors and lock the world out and, and, and simply focus on God waiting for the gift the Father had promised. God wanted them to wait. Peter, Peter wanted to fix something. Peter, Peter wanted to fix the past. Peter wanted to fill in the blanks of what was missing in the moment. Peter wanted to plan out the next steps. And God was just in the process of purging, I think, and, and refining the hearts of his sons and daughters and, and, and just focusing his people on what was going to come next. God just wanted them to wait. But Peter, I guess this is one of the great things about Scripture. Peter, uh, scripture doesn't candy coat our heroes. Peter, Peter just couldn't sit there and wait. He had to, to do something. So in, in a little bit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you into sort of a sort of a searching of your own heart, a piece of sort of self-awareness or self-knowledge. So, so orientation to time, orientation to the past, orientation to the present, orientation to the future. I'm going I'm to ask you to walk through these in a few minutes. Orientation to the past, ask the question, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong that landed me in this present moment? What did I do wrong that sidelined me, that waylaid me, that, that penalty boxed me? What did I do wrong that I wound up in this place, not moving forward, not accomplishing anything, not succeeding anything? What did I do wrong, right? That's an orientation to the past. Orientation to the present. What am I missing? What am I missing? What, what is it that if only I could find it, if only I could fix it, what is it that I'm missing that keeps me from being able to, to sort of move on to the next thing, to, to tip over the next domino? 
what am I, what, what am I missing? An orientation to the future? What must I do? What do I have to accomplish? Where's the next prerequisite I have to get lined out in order to keep moving forward and move ahead? Peter, in Acts chapter 1, in the midst of that prayer meeting where they're all joined in one accord, Peter gets up and he says, hang on, time out, right? We need to replace Judas. I mean, bad things happened before. One of our own number messed up badly enough that we've got to fix that before we can move on. Really, Peter? Is that what we're waiting on? Peter said, here's what we've got to do. We've, we've got to choose one from among us who's walked with us this whole time. Let's, let's, here's what we need to accomplish right now in order to get moving ahead. Really, Peter? Is that what we need to accomplish? Is that, is that the piece that's got to fall into place before we can move forward and, and see what's next? Peter says, let's cast lots. Let's choose someone so we can move on from here. And the whole time... The whole time God was saying, just wait for the gift that's been promised to you. I think we need to acknowledge that we we have this love affair, almost an addiction with knowing the future. There's a passage in, in the book of James. Let me read it to you. He says, you say this today or tomorrow We'll go to this city, we'll go to that city, we'll spend a year there, we'll carry on business, we'll make money. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist. It appears for a little while and then vanish. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. You see, there's this this place of being, if you could just rest in the idea that God knows where you are even if you don't. If you could rest in the idea that God is going to carry you through tomorrow, even if you can't sort it out. Now, I know, I know we need to make plans. I, I, I know we need to have a sense of direction about us, but we got to hold that pretty loosely. And James says, don't be so caught up in the arrogance that says all such boasting is evil, right? Uh, if, if anyone then knows what good they ought to do, and doesn't do it for that man it is sin and it's like James is saying look you know what just just kind of let go of your need for certainty in what comes next and and maybe just trust God for what's coming next that's probably where the real crux of it comes in how do you trust God for what's next when you don't know what's next you don't know how long it'll be but if only you could know God you know where I am you know where I've been, and you know where I'm going. So God, I'm going to trust you for that. Acts chapter 17. Let me take you there. Acts chapter 17, God begins to speak to his folks. He speaks to his people about just what he's accomplishing in the times and the seasons of life. Acts chapter 17. While you're finding that, let me give you a couple of of lines from the book of Proverbs because there's something that There's something we need to know that that God is at work behind the scenes even when we don't see it. In in Proverbs chapter 16, it says this, In their hearts people plan their course, but it's the Lord that establishes their steps. A couple of chapters later, in in chapter 21 of Proverbs, it says, "It, It is the Lord's hand that directs the king's heart like a stream in a channel of water. A person may think their own ways are right, but it's the Lord that weighs the heart. So when Paul was in Athens, he began to speak to the folks there and he began to share the gospel in a way that they could sort of feel the weight of in their own hearts. In Acts chapter 17, Paul begins to make some points about how the Lord made the world and everything in it and and, and all these different gods that they had erected to this thing or that thing. Well, there's one God, Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth and He doesn't live in temples built by human hands and He's not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this. This is the important part. God did this 
so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. It's a beautiful thought. But I want us to focus a little time, a little attention, just for the next couple of minutes. I want us to focus some time on those three ideas of what it means to seek Him, to reach out for Him, and maybe, just maybe, to find Him. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 7. He said, he said ask and keep on asking and seek and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened for you. One thing I've seen in my own self over these last several weeks of just, you know, sequestered time. That's what it feels like to me, sequestered time. I I found myself kind of coming to the end of my distractions and left with nowhere else to turn except to the Lord to say, okay, Father, what is it you're trying to say to me now? What is it you're trying to say in the midst of all this? Have you run out of distractions yet? Because maybe, just maybe, God has brought us to this point so that we would seek Him. So that we would seek Him. It says God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him. That's a crazy word. I I looked it up. I kind of studied that word a little bit. It's a it's a tactile word. It's a word of it's a word of grasping for something. Not just not just an intellectual grasping, but but trying to wrap your mind and your hands around a thing. Trying to it's like trying to sing a song and find your right note. In, in the pitch. It's, it's like trying to strum a guitar chord and trying to make sure that your fingers are on the right strings. It is somehow to make sense of it, not just with your head, but with your hands and with your heart. And then that idea of, of finding Him. You remember in, in Jeremiah chapter 29, famous verse, everybody gives it to graduates. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Remember that one? I know the thoughts I think toward you, declares the Lord. Well, the follow-up to that, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So if we're going to be people who even in uncharted times, even when we don't have a map, we still have our compass, we still know, that He calls us to be God-centered and to genuinely treasure each other and to take risk to be real with one another, not try to put on a facade or or fake our way through it, but be real, And, and and to give and receive grace with one another. Those are our compass points. In times like that, in times like that, how do you seek Him? How do you, how do you reach out for Him? How do you find Him? Well, I want to invite you to chew on some questions with me. This has become kind of an important piece of my own spiritual disciplines in this time to just sort of bring it down to some right now reality, some some sort of uh, where the the, the tires meet the gravel kind of reality. So so here's some questions for you. You ready? I want to invite you to think on this and, and, and maybe even interact with the people that you're watching with. Hopefully you've got some folks that you can interact with this about. Which one of these questions resonates the most with you? Which one lands for you? Are you more the person who is caught up in the regrets of the past? What did I do wrong that got me stuck here now? Are you more the kind of person who is concerned about, maybe afraid of the failures that would cause you to say, what am I missing? What am I missing? Where where can I turn to find the right answer, because if I could just get the right answer, I'll be able to move forward. Is that you, an orientation to the present? Or are you the person who's concerned that maybe you don't have what it takes and you're just not going to be enough for the future? Are you the person who says, what must I do? What am I going to have to accomplish? What am I going to have to, what am I going to have to master in order to climb out of this rut that I'm in, this hole that I'm in? What did, what did I do? What am I missing? What am I going to have to accomplish, past, present, or future? Is it regrets? Is it failures? Or is it the shame of just maybe not being enough that really gets to you? That's going to be important. 
That's going to be important because when you go to apply the gospel to your heart, you're going to need to know a gospel that says, look, you have failed and you have come short of the glory of God. We all have. And the gospel makes a way for you, for me to be forgiven. If you're the kind of person who is just stuck on what am I missing? You're going to have to be the person who comes to a place with the gospel that says, Jesus, you have done for me what I can't possibly do for myself. And when it comes time for you to try to figure out how to go forward and what it would look like for you to measure up, you're going to have to be a person who is able to walk forward from this place with a heart that says, Jesus, my trust is in you. Not in what I can do. My trust is in you. Question number two, you ready? Will you let God call you out as a new creation in Christ Jesus? Do you remember that, that line where Paul says, if any of us is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Can I tell you something? I believe that God, when He said eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3, when God said eternity in our hearts, He put something in us of Him that longs to be like Him. And in a time like this, there's sort of a, a sloughing off and a falling away of all of, the, all of the things that we've layered on top of the Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Augustine had a prayer. Augustine had a prayer that said, Our soul is restless until it finds its rest in you. Will you let God call you out as a new creation in Christ Jesus? Or are you going to come to the end of this time and really not be any different at all? One more question. What are you going to need to let go of in order to reach out for God. Because if your hands are full, if you're already loaded down with as much as you can carry, you're going to have a hard time seeking, reaching out, and finding Him. This would be worth talking about in your community there, in your, in your sort of circle of friends as you worship together this morning. What are you going to need to let go of in order to take hold of Christ. Paul said it in Philippians, he said, he said, I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Let me pray that over you. Will you join me in this? Oh, Father, we have tried and tried and tried to make sense of our lives and our times. We've tried to do for the people around us what honestly, Lord, we couldn't even figure out how to do for ourselves. Father, we come to the end of ourselves. We come to a place where all we have left is to turn to you. And so, Lord, we turn. We turn to the one who has loved us with an everlasting love, who created us with, a, with this divine spark, this moment of eternity in our hearts. Lord, we long for that. We long to find the meaning of the past, the satisfaction of the present, Lord, and the hope for the future. Lord, come among us. And Lord, would you, would you give us the courage to let go and to put down in order to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. I love you, and I love being your pastor. See ya.